This is RTV6 News at 7, working for you. Thanks for joining us here at 7 o'clock. I'm Nicole Griffin. An Indigo bus is off the road and an investigation is underway after passengers felt the effects of a strange smell this morning. A man reached out to RTV6 with this strange situation. He says he was on his way to work on an Indigo bus and noticed a smell. He started coughing. Other passengers around him started coughing and the driver began coughing as well. He says before taking off, the driver flagged down an attendant who brought over a super Supervisor who also started coughing and sneezed and then opened the windows and told the bus driver to take off. My problem was is that the bus driver was feeling it and I kind of thought, you know, you got to drive this bus and, you know, you might run into something if it gets it too intense. He'll pass out or something while he's operating the bus and it'll be some fatality. Sam says the passengers on the bus coughed the whole way from downtown Indy to 46th Street on the north side, even with all the windows down. He says some passengers even got off the bus early due to the fumes. Indigo says they took this bus out of rotation shortly after the passengers felt sick. They say they are working to determine what may have caused them to feel ill. To feel Ill. Tonight, RTV6 is working for you, getting answers for a Mooresville mother who is concerned about her son's safety. Kimberly says people keep bypassing the stop arm on her son's school bus that stops right in front of her house on State Road 144. She reached out to Mooresville Police, the school district, and INDOT sharing her concerns. What well, we've learned, her son's bus is set to now get cameras installed next week. It's part of a demo project aimed at catching drivers not stopping for the bus stop arm. It happens almost daily. Um, and it's just, it's very concerning and very scary because it's one, one little mistake while you're driving and you can hurt somebody. You can not only hurt my kid, but anybody. The Mooresville Consolidated School Corporation says it has already taken steps to monitor this area and one driver has already been caught this year violating the stop arms. Meanwhile, Mooresville police say they had officers out this morning and afternoon and will continue monitoring this area. An Indianapolis woman says a crumbling road at the end of her driveway is becoming a safety concern for the neighborhood. She says she's been trying to get the city to fix it for years, but hasn't had much luck. She reached out to RTV6 for answers, and Megan Sanctorum took her complaints to city leaders. The woman who lives here says her street just keeps getting worse, and she wants the city to fix it before someone gets hurt. It's pretty much been tore up for almost three years now. This is what Woods Crossing Drive looks like outside of Wanda Davis's house on the east side. She says the concrete is crumbling and the ground underneath is sinking in. Pieces of the road sit unattached and Davis compared it to a puzzle, saying she has to put the pieces back together daily. She tells us she has already seen kids get their bikes stuck in it, and now she's worried someone riding or walking by will fall. It's getting frustrating to where you walk out here, you trip over this. I mean, pulling into your driveway, you have to go off road and just to get into your driveway. She keeps detailed notes of her attempts to contact the city. She tells us they've been out before, but prior repairs didn't last long. When we searched her case number with the Mayor's Action Center, it was listed as complete. A spokesperson there tells us the status of a case is updated by the department handling it. In this case, the Department of Public Works said the case was marked as complete because it had been assigned to a crew. About an hour after we left, Davis said they were out marking the area where work will be done. A spokesperson said the actual repairs will be done Monday, weather permitting. Working for you, Megan Sanctorum, RTV6. Megan, thank you. If you have a problem and you feel like no one is listening to you, connect with us at RTV6. You can send a message on Facebook or to our email, workingforyou at rtv6.com. Let's take a live look outside right now. Kevin, it has been a windy day and a little cooler than yesterday. Will that continue in the days to come? Uh, temperatures tomorrow would stay in the 50s once again. Yeah, we were at 65 yesterday, the good old days. 50s right now. Do you see some of the color in the trees there in Speedway? Look 
looking good. 53 in Fishers, 54 in Plainfield. Lots of clouds, very little in the way of any showers. Down to the south, we've had a few sprinkles. That's really about it. Temperatures pretty consistent in the low to mid 50s, anywhere from Lafayette, Muncie South. It's in the 40s in Gary and in Fort Wayne. Let me show you that wind. Uh, this week, we've had uh, several days where it's been very windy. Today, a little bit of a break. And then I think on Saturday, when we see the rain come back in, the wind will really start whipping again with some 30 mile per hour gusts. Gray represents all the cloud cover statewide. We zoom in and the showers have tried to come to the north. See the little green specks there uh, just to the west of uh, 31 and from Franklin to Edinburgh to the west and then also northeast of Martinsville, a sprinkle or two that would really do it. Temperatures, they're in the 50s and just sitting there. They won't change much between now and 11 o'clock tonight in the morning. Plan on temperatures in the 40s, generally upper 40s. We'll talk about when rain returns for the weekend, how much rain we may see, and then the big temperature tumble for next week coming up. Be more, please. Yeah, I need an officer over here at Jackson Park Apartment. Okay, what's going on? I, w I took my dog for a walk over here across the street, and back in the woods, I found a newborn baby tied up in a Walmart bag. That call came into police eight days ago when a woman walking her dog found a baby left inside a tied plastic bag. And today we're learning about new evidence in the case. Police say they found a couple of strands of hair in the Walmart bag the baby was discovered in last week in Seymour. We don't know who they were from, but they were from someone other than the infant. The child was only two to three hours old, and tonight the baby is out of the hospital and with a foster family. Police are still trying to figure out who the mother is and why the baby was abandoned on October 15th near a fence off South Jackson Park Drive. Seymour police say they have canvassed the area and looked for surveillance video. Police are sending any evidence they have collected from the scene, including the bag, the towel that the baby was wrapped in, and anything the baby was laid on after the fact to the Indiana State police lab. If you have any information on this case, you are asked to contact Seymour Police. A cherished friend and inspirational mentor to young leaders. Those are just some of the couple ways that leaders describe P.E. McAllister, an Indianapolis businessman and philanthropist who died this week. McAllister was regarded as a legend in Indianapolis, especially in his civic leadership and philanthropy. Leaders from Indianapolis, including Mayor Joe Hogsett to Governor Eric Holcomb, say they are in mourning today for, for this man who, quote, had a heart for Indiana. McAllister received Indiana's highest honor, the Sackham Award in 2015. In 2014, he was 101 years old. Because of a delayed farming season, it's more important than ever for first responders to be ready to rescue farmers who may have fallen into a grain bin. That is why the Wayne Township Fire Department took part in this special training today. Captain Michael Pruitt says when a farmer falls into a grain bin, it can become a multi-agency multi response, so everyone needs to be prepared. Pruitt says grain bin accidents can be deadly for the person involved if they don't get help quickly enough. What typically gets people in trouble is they get up in the bin for one reason or another while they're unloading this green bin. And when it's unloading, it's like standing in quicksand. And it literally will pull you under and you cannot defend yourself and, and self-rescue yourself when that happens. So that's when we see these tragic events occur. Pruitt says because the farming season is running a little bit late this year, farmers may be in more of a hurry and might take some shortcuts. Add in their tiredness and long hours and accidents can happen. Coming up, mass blackouts are set to affect hundreds of thousands of California as California prepares for hot and windy weather, preventing wildfires as crews prepare to battle flames. Plus, the impeachment inquiry into President Trump's behavior pauses for a moment so that Washington can say goodbye to an iconic lawmaker. Remembering the late Elijah Cummings next when the News at 7 continues. Storm Team 6 working for you. This is the news at 7 on RTV6. Tonight, we're looking at the expanding wildfire threat in California. With Santa Ana winds expected to increase, the Kincaid fire has grown to 10,000 acres and counting. Meanwhile, thousands of residents are bracing for a blackout designed to prevent even more fires. ABC's Marcy Gonzalez is in Porter Ranch, California with the very latest. 
Hot flames raging up hillsides, overtaking roads and destroying several homes as the wildfire threat in California intensifies. We just can't keep ahead of it. We're almost just chasing it and trying to get ahead of it. The Kincaid fire erupting in Sonoma County, fueled by powerful Santa Ana winds gusting up to 70 miles an hour forcing mandatory evacuations. The entire town of Geyserville told to leave. They were really, get out now. Grab your keys and your dogs and go. And uh, basically that's what we did. Ahead of these red flag warnings, utility companies concerned about electrical lines sparking wildfires, preemptively cutting off power to more than 100,000 customers. I've been getting phone calls since four o'clock in the morning trying to get uh, generators hooked up. Now firefighters out in force doing airdrops, working around the clock to contain the flames. The aircraft are working at this very moment, all the parts of the fire that they can. And they have a tough battle ahead, even as these extreme fire conditions move south. These strong winds you can especially see blowing through those palm trees, as well as the heat and low humidity are expected to continue here in Southern California through tomorrow. Marcy Gonzalez, ABC News, Porter Ranch, California. Washington has put a hold on its disagreements and controversy to say goodbye to the late Maryland representative Elijah Cummings. He died October 17th after long-standing health problems. Today, congressional leaders spoke at an arrival ceremony before Cummings began to lie in state at Statuary Hall. The public being allowed to pay respects as well. A wake and funeral are planned for tomorrow in Baltimore. A sharecropper's son, Cummings rose to become a civil rights champion, committee chairman and leader of an impeachment inquiry of President Donald Trump. As a tribute to him, no votes are scheduled for today in the House of Representatives. Coming up, new dog, old tricks. Vaping companies are using some old tactics to market their products. The marketing that just seems all too familiar. Coming up next, Kevin. And if you've been waiting for a soaking rain, there's one in the forecast, maybe too much rain in some spots. We'll talk about the timing and get into some of these amounts coming up. America. Appointments available now. This is RTV6 News at 7, working for you. Bright labels with pictures of candy. It can make vaping look pretty tempting. And it's a tactic critics say make more people, including kids, choose to use vaping products. Our Annie Taylor is looking into why that's the case. E-cigarettes. They're popular with people trying to quit traditional cigarettes. And now e-cig companies are attracting more than tobacco users. They're, they're doing a lot of what early tobacco companies did, which is glamorize the use of the product. And even though it might be intended, the message might be intended for adults, sort of like Joe Camel, the cartoon character, it might still resonate with children. Marketing professional Darren Duber-Smith is no stranger to tobacco product marketing. He says he's seen classic messages shift from pushing cigarettes to pushing e-cigarettes. And he's not the only one. If you look at the coloring and the fonts and, and the whole positioning of the campaign, it was, it was clearly targeted direct uh, to, to young adults. Stanton Glantz started studying the tobacco industry in 1978. Putting the products as uh, fun as ways to affiliate with your friends. The FDA noticed it recently sent a warning to one of the biggest brands in e-cigs, Juul, for the way it marketed its products. I think the regulatory environment is now playing catch up and they're starting to look at this category as the, they've looked at the tobacco category and they're starting to see the, the youth addiction and that sort of thing. He used all of the knowledge that the big cigarette companies had developed in order to hook kids to design their product and design their marketing campaign. Jewel responded by announcing it would pull all of its advertising. The brands operate in the world of public perception. So Jewel, unfortunately, is taking the brunt of this. Only about 15 years passed between the time e-cigs came to America to when Jewel stopped its marketing. Um, I'm gonna get some of the... But news of more than a thousand vape-related lung illnesses and several deaths also came much more quickly than it did with cigarettes. And just like tobacco companies, e-cig companies might soon see stricter regulations. A lot of it's gonna come down to what the FDA does. 
All right, and looking ahead to your Storm Team 6 forecast, Chief Meteorologist Kevin Gregory here now. Kevin, I feel like today was really windy and a little chilly, but not too bad outside. 50s, we're getting used to it because we've got temperatures in the low 40s for highs oh. as we get to next week. That may help you pick out a costume for the kids for a little trick-or-treating. They'll need to stay warm. That's a preview. Saturday rain, and it looks like we could see quite a bit of rain. I'll, just, I'll define quite a bit here in a second. Then it turns colder in the middle of next week. Cold enough that a rain-snow mix or just some snow showers and rain showers across the state, especially northwest portions of the state as we get into Wednesday night and then on Halloween. Rainfall potential right there, one to three inches mainly from Saturday morning until the overnight hours into Sunday morning. On Sunday, we'll dry out and skies will become partly cloudy. We'll need some time to dry out. At least the ground isn't frozen. Obviously, that will allow this to soak in. I just remind you, storm drains in your neighborhood, go ahead and make sure the leaves aren't clogging those up. So if you have any uh, traditional spots where uh, water really uh, pools, you'll want to make sure that these storm drains are clean. Around two inches, all four models pretty much consistent with that rainfall potential for Indianapolis. There are other spots that may see more than that, and where this axis of heaviest rain will end up is still to be determined. Pretty confident that widespread rain happens where uh, spots will see three inches is another question. I mentioned the Storm Shield app, not because we're expecting severe weather, but because it's handy. It is free, and it's a weather radio for your phone. If there are any advisories or that would come out, you'd get that notification, but it will also just give you the ability to check the radar at any time and uh, see how much time you have before it pours on you. Sullivan 55, temperature in Indy 2 degrees cooler. We've got a couple now in the upper 40s, Crawfordsville on over to Frankfurt and the Tipton. During the day tomorrow, a lot of clouds. The wind will be light north at about 5. By noon, 53. Afternoon high temperature, 58 degrees. A gray day start to finish. Temperatures below average for this time of year. As we get to Friday night football, important games as a sectional start 56 at kickoff 51 at 9 o'clock. As you look at the weekend, we mentioned the rain Saturday, 60 degrees. I'll mention something else about Saturday. The wind will gust to 30 miles per hour Sunday at 62. There's the rain shield, 7 a.m. by 1 o'clock, expanding, covering all of central Indiana. And as we get to the evening, 7 to 11, some more waves of rain. Those will finally move out to the east as we get uh, through the overnight. The wind will gust to 30 as we have that rain. The umbrella may not be too useful. Seven-day forecast, cold enough. Temperature down to 28 on uh, Thursday morning of next week that we may see a little rain-snow mix Wednesday night and possibly on Halloween, especially north and west of Indy. Too bad Halloween's not just like a few weeks earlier. Well, it's always <laughs> timing. You know, it may end up being warmer in November. That's we'll true. see. That's true. We'll see. All right. Thank you, Kevin. Kevin. Well, still ahead, we take you way back with a look into Indiana history and our throwback Thursday. That's next right here on RTV6. This is the news at 7. RTV6 is hiring Hoosiers is how we keep an eye out for resources and jobs for you. And we just spotted a fun opportunity if you consider yourself especially festive. The Noblesville Parks Department is looking for seasonal workers for its Federal Hill Commons Ice Plaza. The ice rink is returning for its third season and the city says it's looking to hire a site coordinator and several rink monitors. To apply, we put all the information you need to know at HiringHoosiers.com. It's time once again to climb into our time machine for Throwback Thursday. And believe it or not, 1982 was a controversial year for cats. That was the year the best-selling Cat Haters Handbook was published. But RTV6 found a place where cats were definitely loved. Reporter Phil Ponce took us to the American Cat Fanciers Association show. It was held at the Indiana State Fairgrounds. Definitely no cat haters here. And those attending the event had some interesting opinions about those who did not share their love for felines. Why do so many people hate cats? Why do they arouse such strong feelings? I think it goes back to mythology, where the cats were a handmaiden of the devil. 
and they think they're sneaky. They're not. They're independent. They're too smart to do what their owners really want. They do what they want to do on their own terms. Gary Hollingsworth of Muncie, another cat worshiper, told me cat haters should take a look at themselves. People that don't like cats can be very interesting people. They must not be very deep. A little bit shallow, I would, in my opinion. So you think to like cats means to have a certain depth of personality? Yes, I do. The Cat Fanciers Association is still around, and they are co-sponsoring the Indianapolis area cat show and adopt-a-thon. It is this weekend at the Hendricks County 4-H Fair Power Exposition Hall in Danville. Some strong words there for the cat haters. We love cats and dogs. <laughs> we, we love do. all animals, and say a little butters. I do my best to take you know your pets for a walk during my forecast. Butters is happy on the sofa, doesn't want to hear about wet weather on Saturday, but it's dry now. We live there. All right. Sounds good. Thank you, Kevin. And thank you for joining us. Have a great night.